India. The, the only land where the smallest of everyday acts are pervaded with spiritual ethos. This is a land and culture which has for thousands of years nurtured yogis, siddhas and realized beings. These beings explored life in depth, looked at all aspects of human well-being and consciously structured the culture so that even the simplest act became a spiritual one. Spirituality has stayed alive and flourished for so many centuries in India because these beings created spaces and temples where they invested their knowing. Kailash is one such place which is a powerhouse of energy. The first being to store his knowing in an energy form here was the Adi Yogi Shiva himself. Though they are thronged by worshippers, the ancient temples were originally built not as places of worship, but as powerful energy centers which allowed people to transform themselves in a very deep way. A visit to the temple in the morning allowed one to go about his daily work with a certain sense of balance and depth. There was a deep and exact science of temple building. The temples in India were created according to the instructions laid out in the Agama Shastras. Each Jyotirlinga temple had a specific function. If you want health, you go to a certain temple. If you want material well-being, you go to another. Each temple was created to address a different aspect of life. The existing lingas in these temples have been consecrated for one or two particular chakras which benefit people accordingly. But many enlightened beings down the ages dreamed of a temple that held a linga with all seven chakras fully energized. A Dhyana Linga temple. Of all the temples, this is the most complex to create. And so difficult is the task that it never happened. The closest attempt to consecrate such a Dhyana Linga took place almost a thousand years ago in Bhojpur in Madhya Pradesh. But the consecration process could not be completed. There is now only one place where a Dhyana Linga stands, the only one to be fully consecrated in over 2,000 years. The Veliangiri Mountains are known as the Kailash of the South because they have been the abode of countless Siddhas, Seers and Sages since time immemorial. Shiva himself is said to have spent time in these mountains. It is at the foothills of the Valyangiri Mountains that Sadhguru Jaggi Vasudev established the Dhyana Linga. It took him three lifetimes of intense sadhana to achieve this. The consecration of Dhyana Linga involved an intense process of prana pratishtha which spanned over three years. In India, it is tradition that prior to entering any temple, one is required to wet one's entire body to help make one more receptive to the energies of the temple. The Tirthkund is a subterranean tank 
with a solidified mercury lingam immersed in water. These rasa lingams were consecrated in a particular way, fundamentally as a preparatory tool to enhance spiritual receptivity in a person before he enters the dhyana linga. The Tirth Kun's energy-soaked water has an uplifting effect on the physical body in terms of health and well-being and stabilizes the pranic imbalances in a person. Before the entrance of the inner parikrama is the Sarva Dharma Stambha. Symbols of all the major religions of the world are inscribed on three sides of the Stambha. A welcome that goes beyond religious divides. To reach the open pathway, the inner parikrama, one must climb three steps. The unusual height of the steps forces the visitor to press the soles of his feet onto the pebbled surface of these steps, which in turn activates certain nerve centers in the body, a preparation of the system to make it more receptive to the energies of the Dhyanalinga. The entrance of the Parikrama is graced by Patanjali Maharishi, who is regarded as the father of yogic sciences. On the other side is the Vanashri Shrine, the feminine deity of the Dhyanalinga. The energies of the deity are such that it is specially beneficial for women and children. The six panels on the approach depict moments from the lives of six South Indian sages who reached the peak of consciousness through their devotion to the divine. One finally stands before the immense and awe-inspiring Dhyanalinga, vibrating with the power of the primordial. It casts its spell on all those who enter its enigmatic presence. There is no other such linga in the world. It is Sadhguru's wish that all the visitors be allowed directly into the Garbhagriha or the Sanctum Sanctorum, a rare privilege. In Sanskrit, Dhyana means meditation, Linga means form. Here, Sitting silently for a few minutes within the sphere of the Dhyana Linga is enough to make even those unaware of meditation experience a deep state of meditativeness. Being in the presence of the Dhyana Linga offers a person the rare privilege and the intimacy of being with a Guru. With all seven chakras energized to the very peak, it touches one in a different dimension sowing the seed of spiritual liberation in a person. Linga Bhairavi consecration will be in many ways the biggest event to happen in Asia after Dhyana Linga consecration. In real terms. <laughs> I'm saying real terms because that's my essential work. Dhyana Linga is complete by itself, but uh, putting a, a proper, appropriate feminine counter to him is an essential part. If you transform mud into food, we call this agriculture. If you make food into flesh and bone, we call this digestion, integration. If you can make this flesh or even a stone or even an empty space into a divine possibility, that is called consecration. Maha One who earns uh, the grace of Bhairavi, 
neither have to live in concern or fear of life or death, of poverty or failure. All that human being considers as well-being will be his if only he earns the grace of Bhairavi. Dhyanalinga is going to be only one, we can… we cannot recreate it. What has gone into it is too much to make it again. But other kinds of consecrated spaces, this is one thing we want to do. We wanted to create… we want to create as many consecrated spaces as possible on the planet. Either in the form of Devi or in any other form, particularly in this culture, enormous amount of knowledge about this dimension of life was perpetuated and this was held as the most important thing because it doesn't matter what you're eating, how you are, how long you live, that at some point a need will come that you want to get in touch with the source of creation. And if that possibility is not created across the planet, if that possibility is not available to every human being who seeks, then that society has failed to provide true well-being for a human being. If we create this kind of supports in the society, it need not be attached to any particular religion. If you consecrate every home, every street, every city on the planet, you will see the way people function will change dramatically.